TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are not live. But you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Um, if we do go live and you miss it, this is where all the highlights will be. Um, don't forget, we do got the Patreon. This is where we watch stuff that we can't watch on YouTube. So we watch it over here. And we also got the Discord as well for your request. And, you know, just to have a little community, chop it up. But this is this is this is next, man. Top ten lies you believe about Britain. Should be interesting. I don't think I believe any lies about Britain, but let's see if I that I if I think it's true and do I believe it. I, I just said the same thing twice. <laughs> it's time to brush up on your British general knowledge. I'm Ashley with Watch Mojo UK, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 lies you believe about Britain. Before we begin, we publish new content our latest video about this country. Number 10. All swans are property of the Queen. We've all been brought up to believe- I never even heard that. Never even heard that. First of all, I haven't seen a swan in like 2-3 years. Coming from America. I ain't seen a swan in two, three years, but I never even heard this. So believe that all swans belong to the queen, and therefore harming them or eating them is a big no-no. Who's eating swans? However, one five-year-old swan enthusiast wrote to the queen asking if she could have one, and the response she got surprised us all. A representative wrote back debunking the common misconception that seems to date back to the 12th century. The monarch actually only owns all unmarked mute swans in open water around certain areas of the River Thames and Windsor. Every year, local children are invited to witness the swan upping event, which helps keep track of the birds. Oh. I didn't know she owned any swans. Okay. Number nine, London is buried under fog. London is buried under fog. Fog everywhere. So begins Charles Dickens' Bleak House, and yet somehow the reputation has stuck even to this day. Due to the Industrial Revolution during the 19th century, London- So for this one, yeah. Before I knew about London, I thought it was a foggy place. All the movies are starting off in fog, so. Londoners did see an average of 63 foggy days per year, and in 1952, the Great Smog was said to have killed around 12,000 people. Smoke from the capital's chimneys is being trapped at street level, which is aggravating the fog. Nowadays, you'll actually find that London, or anywhere else in the UK really, doesn't even cut the top 10 foggiest countries around the world, with Grand Banks Newfoundland Canada taking the top spot. Canada knew it. Once coal fires were banned, London saw less fog, and today, it's not as common as you would think. Number 8. Lady Godiva rode naked on horseback. <laughs> Lady Godiva wasn't just a made-up figure from a Tennyson poem or a delicious brand of chocolate. Yeah, that's a, Godiva. All I know Godiva for is having good chocolate. I didn't even know that was a real person who rode around on horses naked. In Tennyson's versions of events, Lady Godiva rode naked on horseback through the streets of Coventry in response to her husband Leofric's oppressive tax. In reality, there are some sources that suggest that her lord husband requested she do just that. She looked good, whoever this actor is. Or but there is insufficient proof it is really her. that she followed through, with most historians insisting she don't even got both. She not even straddling. You know what? Never mind. That it never happened. This story only started making the rounds around 100 years after her death, and by a monk whose storytelling didn't always adhere to the truth. Number seven: Great Britain, the UK, and England are synonyms. For nah, I used to believe that. I didn't know there was a difference, but now I know. England, James. No. What if you could do SEO smarter? <laughs> Number eight, Lady Gadot made up Fitton's versions of. Didn't always adhere to the truth. 
Number seven, Great Britain, the UK, and England as synonyms. For England, James? No. For me. Getting this wrong is a surefire way to make enemies across the UK. Just try asking a Scot what part of England they're from. Go ahead, we dare you. Great Britain is an island made up of England, Scotland and Wales. Great Britain and Northern Ireland together make up the United okay. Kingdom. Emphasis on the Northern, yes, that's- I'm not even gonna lie that as long- I'm not even gonna lie, as long as I've been doing UK reactions, I just found that out this year. That's crazy. It's another border you don't want to mix up. We'd also tell you about the Channel Islands, British Isles, Isle of Man, and so on. But we suggest you get your head around the basics first. And then we can talk. Number six, you're never far from a rat in London. Another stereotype of England's capital is that you're never more than six feet away from a rat at any given time. I heard this, but you gotta remember, like, I've been to New York and I lived in Chicago. Two places with way more rats than this. <laughs> Now, London is approximately 1,572 kilometers squared, and there are around 10.5 million rats in the UK. You do the maths. It's possible that a former Minister of Agriculture invented this little rumor to promote hygiene in homes, which makes you wonder just how bad things must have been. According to Dr. Dave Cowan, the truth is that you're more likely to be around 50 meters away from a rat at any time. Sounds a lot less disgusting now, right? No, it doesn't. It still sounds equally disgusting as what you said before. It's all nasty. Number five, Richard III was a bad guy. Chances are- Heard that. Or if you grew up in the UK, you were taught about the villainous Richard III, who walked around with a limp and had a hunchback. History tells us that he was this terrible geezer who stole the throne from his brother, He's in a lot of movies too. Locked his nephews in a tower and ultimately had them killed. But in reality, when his reign... Okay, come on. What movie is this? He, he suffocated somebody with a pillow standing up? Just, hey, back up. Just back up. Back up. When it came to an end, the Tudor dynasty took the throne. And let's just say that historians decided to record things a little differently. Shakespeare may have played his part in this retelling of events too. There's taking creative license, and then there's completely rewriting history. He looked exactly the same as he did in Shrek. It's crazy. A horse! My kingdom for a horse! Number four, Big Ben is a clock. One of the most iconic. How rude! Big Ben is more than a clock. Iconic features of the London skyline. Is it not a clock? <laughs> has been dubbed Big Ben by tourists and locals alike, but it wasn't always called that. In the Victorian era, it was called St. Stephen's Tower, and until recently, it was just named the Clock Tower. And you really can't go wrong with that. However, today its official name is the Elizabeth Tower in celebration of the Queen's Diamond Jubilee in 2012. But as interesting as this is, it's all superfluous for the discussion at hand. That's because Big Ben is the nickname of the bell, not the tower that houses it. Oh my god. Wow. Wow, that's a sneaky one. That's like a trick question. Uh, yeah, Big Ben is the bell, not the clock. Okay. I literally just watched a video on this. Last week. Number three, the Great Fire of London ended the plague. When you learned about the Black Plague at school, it was almost always immediately followed by a lesson about the Great Fire of London because right. it was said that this fire that devastated London actually brought an end to the plague, right? Well, right. no, not really. The fire only burned up about a quarter of urban London, with the worst areas affected by plague, Whitechapel, Clerkenwell, and Southwark getting through it with barely a singe. Oh, wow. By the time the fire started, deaths from plague were already on the decline, 
but once the fire was over, it was still not extinct. Number 2. The Royal Family Always Lives in Buckingham Palace Crowds swarm Buckingham Palace every- Oh, we know that's not true. From, you know, Prince and Meghan. Yeah, in the hope of seeing the changing of the guards, or better yet, a member of the royal family leaving the palace to run some royal errands. The only problem is, none of the royal family live full-time in Buckingham Palace. It's more like the Queen's office and a nice venue for special events. Oh, <laughs> so very heavy. Nobody lived there. Okay, all right, okay. Yes. People also mistakenly look out for the Union Jack to know if the Queen is in, but it's actually a different flag, the Royal Standard, that's flown at the Royal Residences, Buckingham Palace, Windsor Castle, or Sandringham House when she's present. Number 1. The Queen is All Powerful R.I.P. the Queen. The job description of monarch has changed since the days of Henry VIII, but the Queen still does have a number of powers. Uh, before this year, I thought the Queen did everything too. I thought she was the president. I thought she did everything. And it's not all about traveling the world and waving politely. But in today's British constitution, she has minutes. More so of the Prime Minister and, a lot, and the House of Parliament. And ministers who are entrusted with exercising her powers. The Queen can summon Parliament, sign bills into laws, appoint or remove ministers, appoint the Prime Minister, and declare war, just to name a few. Oh, really? She, she still did a lot. Please. Boom. A lot of these motions are ceremonial, but it's good to know that if we were ever on the verge of war, the Queen has the power to pull that plug. Shoo. Would I say I learned a lot from this video? Eh. Tell her leave a like, comment, I'm gone.